Sunday, check. We did it, right? We did it. We're in church. We're in church with our family. We're in church with our loved ones. And it's so, such a good day to dive into the word of God. Are you guys ready? I'm ready. So we're kicking off um, a new series. And I want to motivate you to get reading um, just to get some more information on this, right? And I'll, I'll let you know what book I want you to read in just a moment. So the title of this message is Stand Up and Rebuild. It's actually the title of the entire series is Stand Up and Rebuild. So for the past few months, I usually organize the church calendar and um, maybe November-ish, I start to think and pray about what we're going to be speaking on the, the calendar for the entire year. And that's just the way I've always done it. And um, I have just been so drawn to this one book of the Bible, like, like where you're just captivated by it, where you're listening to all the teachings on it, um, you know, wanting to find out more information about it. Um, this one story, this one character, this, this, this story that has such rich, rich teachings, because when you read the details, you learn so much from it. And the more you read, the more details, you know, call out to you, the more you are moved by the story. And it's a story about having the strength to rebuild from the rubble. Because it takes a different strength. It takes a different strength to rebuild from nothing and just rebuild new. I mean, to build new. I'm sorry, I used the wrong word. To build new. But it takes a different strength, a different mindset to look at rubble and say, I'm willing to rebuild. From the broken pieces, rebuild from the fragments left behind, rebuild from the reminders of what once was. And you look at it and you say, can it be beautiful again? What once was strong, what, what, what you felt secure with, right? And now we need to restore it and rebuild it. The, def the definition that I have found of rebuilding is to make, to restore, to construct, to build, or to form again. Say again. See, again is the key word. Say again. Look at the person next to you and just tap them and say yes again. You have said never again, right? For the bad stuff, that's good, but how about for the good stuff? How about for that relationship? How about for that family, right? I trust that God will use this series for three weeks, this is today, two more weeks, to encourage you. Yes, I love to encourage you. But more than that, I would, my prayer is that it would open your eyes, that at the same time, it would actually challenge you to have enough strength to make again, enough strength to construct again, to build again, to form again, to love again. Come on, church. So the, for the next few weeks, we're going to be diving into this book, diving deep into this story that began on what appeared just to be a normal day with just an ordinary guy. It was a day like any other day, but this ordinary guy hears news that moved him so deeply that it changed the course of his life. And this guy was not a pastor. This guy was not a prophet. This guy was no builder. He wasn't an architect. He wasn't a king. He, he wasn't, you know, he didn't have money or, or, or wasn't this, this warrior. But he was an ordinary guy. I don't know about you, but I really do identify with that. Where you're just an ordinary person, but you saw something that bothers you so intensely you see something that gets into your heart, that you're compelled, you, you can't help it, but want to step up and make an extraordinary difference. I don't know about you, but I'm all about making an extraordinary difference, make a difference, amen? So let's take a, a step back for just a moment and see what led to this moment. And this is the story of Nehemiah. And I'd love you to read the story in the Bible. So what led up to this? 140 years before Nehemiah's time, 140 years, back when Nebuchadnezzar ruled, the temple of Solomon, the great temple, the son of David, the one that was like, wow. It, I mean, no 
uh, cost was spared on this. It was beautiful. But during the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, it was totaled. It was thrashed. But not only was it destroyed, the walls that surrounding the city, the walls that protected the city were also destroyed and the gates were burned to the ground. And after years of the Babylonian, of Babylonian captivity, 50,000 Jews were allowed to go back to the city to rebuild the temple. And as you can imagine, as with all situations when people want to rebuild, optimism is high, right? You're like, okay, I'm going to do it. You finally talked yourself into, you look at the rubble, you look at the mess. It's like when your room is a mess, you haven't put anything away, your clothes are everywhere. You're like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to clean out my closet. You know, I'm going to clean my room. I'm going to clean the garage. Come on, guys. I'm going to clean the garage. But you get there and you start with optimism, with enthusiasm. But an hour in, it kind of wears out, right? <laughs> it does. It wears out because you become your own enemy or because you just see that it's just very difficult. Because there will always be opposition when you are open to re restoration. Come on, if you're taking notes, that's a big one. There will always be opposition when you are open to restoration. And there will always be opposition when it's time to rebuild. See, in Ezra's time, this was the first wave of 50,000 Jews. There was three waves. Three waves that they were taken into captivity. Three waves of people that were returned. And it says that all the local residents tried to discourage and frighten the people of Judah to keep them from their work. They bribed agents. Sounds like my country, like Mexico. They bribed agents to work against them and to frustrate their plans. Like there was people trying to come against the restoration, come against the rebuilding. They were like, no, we're going to frustrate those plans. This went on during the entire reign of King Cyrus of Persia and lasted until King Darius of Persia took throne, it says. So the enemy succeeded in stopping construction for the next 15 years of the temple because they bribed people to say, you can't do it. It can't be done. It can't be rebuilt. It is not worth it. So for 15 years, this reconstruction was, was, um, was stopped. And the city walls and gates still remained in ruins. When the Jews returned, they had attempted to restore its defenses. But with time, they were able to construct the temple. They got back into building. But what they weren't able to do was reconstruct the walls. They weren't able to reconstruct that which protected them. And so the work of restoration stalled again. They got done with the temple, and then they looked at the walls and said, we can't do it. We've done enough. We're tired. It's impossible. When Nehemiah's brother returned to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, I'm sorry, he was there in Jerusalem, Nehemiah found out that the temple was the only thing that had been reconstructed. See, in the walls, a lot of people's homes were there. A lot of people lived in those walls. And so there were many broken homes. See, those walls were the walls of, rest of, of protection. But for the last 70 years, the temple was constructed, but nothing was done to the walls. So there was word, and there was a place of worship, but there was no protection. So then Nehemiah 1.3 says, they said to me, this is his brother and the friends from Jerusalem, things are not going well. Things aren't going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. It's important to understand then that the, in Nehemiah's time, this, these walls being broken meant that they were completely helpless. They were, there was actually a saying at the time that was said, a city without walls is not a city at all. Because there was no protection. No wall meant that for as much as you rebuilt, you were open to the enemy coming to tear down again. What you rebuilt, the enemy could come and attack again. 
You were an open target. And this is what had been stalled. Their enemies could easily attack them, and there was no way to defend themselves. There was no barrier between them and the enemy. Am I speaking to someone today? So for as much word and as much worship that we have, when we do not protect the word and the worship and the, the time that we have, it can be stolen. Come on. Without walls, there was no way to keep the enemy out because walls meant that there, that no walls meant that they were an open target. What walls are down in your life? What walls are rubble, have been torn down where you're not protected, where you've opened yourself up to the attack of the enemy. And my next question is, who will rebuild them? Will you step up to say, you know what, mom and dad? Keep my phone during the night. I can't have it. I'm unprotected. Will parents put protective barriers on those phones? Will marriages hold themselves each accountable and submit to one another in order to protect the family? Will we be a church that, that will protect what we hear from the enemy and discouragement? So who will we build? Who will rebuild and what walls are down? How intentional would you be in rebuilding walls if you knew that your family was open to an attack? If you knew that someone was going to break into your house tonight at 9 p.m., how, what would you do? You would, re if I could, I could show you for certain that there was an enemy that was out to kill, steal, and destroy. How would you protect your home? How would you keep your children safe? What would you do? Would you say, oh, I'm just going to leave the door open, unlocked, the garage open, right? What else do they need, the code to the alarm system? No, let's not put it. Not worth it. Maybe a window. It's kind of hot. Let me crack a window. There is an enemy. There is an enemy, and he wants to come and kill, steal, and destroy. Not only your life, but your family. That's the truth, your relationships. And we're leaving windows cracked open. And we're leaving doors unlocked. And we're leaving the garage door open. How would you defend your home if you knew the enemy was coming? I believe that the story is not, the story of Nehemiah is not mere history, guys. Come on, church, this is not just history. Rather, it's, a record, it's recorded as instruction for us. It's an object lesson for us today about the importance of securing our homes, securing our worship, securing the word so that the thief can't come to steal, kill, and destroy. Can someone say amen to that? Come on. Come on. Now, Nehemiah could have easily said, poor them. <laughs> poor them. Their walls are down, but I don't live there. I live far away. Let me shed a tear and I'll pray for it. He could have easily said that. Wow, that's too bad. Wow, they're getting a divorce. Oh, that's too bad. Well, she was always, you know, she was always nitpicking anyway. Oh, what? Their, their child left the house? Oh, well. They're not good parents anyway. Like, I mean, I would leave too. I would have run away. Am I speaking truth? I mean, Nehemiah could have easily said, poor them. I'm not directly affected. He could have received this news of simple information, had that attitude. Well, that sucks for them. <laughs> that just sucks for them. But no, his eyes were open. His heart was moved. It says in Nehemiah 1, 4, when I heard these things, this is a journal. The book of Nehemiah is actually his journal. 
And he says, when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. When was the last time you saw something, you heard something that brought you to tears? That you were so convicted about it. That someone is sick and you identify with that. He was devastated. He was crushed inside because of the broken walls of Jerusalem. Here's the question. Do you feel for what is broken around you? Are you crushed for what is broken around us as a society? He sat down to cry. But his tears, what I love about the story is that his tears were not just tears. They carried the weight of a broken city. His cry was for restoration. He was crying because no one had stepped up. He wasn't crying thinking that's the end. He was crying, and his cry was, we need to restore these walls. We need to rebuild these homes. Can I get an amen? The, yes, come on, come on. We need to restore our homes. We need to restore our society. We need to restore the school district. Come on. The suffering of his people was his suffering. The shame of his people was his shame. Again, it would have been so easy for him to shake off the bad news. Oh, there's, this has happened to them, but it's not happening to me. Keep going, keep doing what you're doing. Keep serving the king as his cupbearer. He, he could have done that, but he didn't do that. He didn't look the other way. He didn't pretend like it wasn't happening. Oh, everything's fine. There's a little broken pieces here and there. Some of us have broken walls and it's rubble and we're justifying it. Oh, there's just a little crack. Oh, it's just a little weak. No, it's rubble. Your walls are broken. There is no defense. The news of broken walls broke his heart. Question, what breaks your heart? What breaks your heart? The answer to that question is a calling upon your life. I'm going to say it again. Your answer to that question is a calling for your life. Because what breaks your heart is what God has deposited so that you can, like Nehemiah say, there is a cry for restoration and a cry for rebuilding. Can I get an amen to that? Come on, church. When you hear that children are w without proper drinking water in other countries, when you know that there's children here, and you know that they're living in horrendous situations, when you see people homeless on the streets at our city, you can just go right outside our doors. When you hear or see children that are abandoned, or people that are abused or trafficked or neglected, when one of your family members or someone you know is struggling with addiction or held hostage by drugs, what breaks your heart? When you hear that a teen has run away, when you know a family that is struggling, when, you, when a father or a mother abandoned the home, when you see an elderly person eating alone at a restaurant, what breaks your heart when you realize that there's so many sick people in hospitals and not one person to go and visit them? What breaks your heart? See, Nehemiah sat down to cry. He felt the pain and he felt the burden. And it says, Nehemiah 1, 4, for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So not only did Nehemiah sit down to cry, but he knelt down to pray and fast. So number one, he sat down to cry. Number two, he knelt down to pray and fast. That's precisely what we're doing in these 21 days. I've been asking you these questions because I want to pastor you through these 21 days. What breaks your heart that's a calling within your life? 
Now it's time to pray and fast about that. See, Nehemiah, Nehemiah's cry was accompanied with fervent prayer. He didn't just have a pity party. He didn't just shed tears for the situation. He went before God with the situation. See, prayer is talking to God. Talk to God. Talk to God. Oh, I don't know how to pray. Do you know how to talk? Talk to God. We don't need this, the eloquency of, of people. And I love people. I love to hear certain people pray. Like, you're so amazing. I wish I could pray like you. But I'm like raw and I'm real. And I'm sometimes like, I don't like this. It sucks. I need you. Like, I'm just like, take off my mask. Like, I, you, we do enough pretending in the day. You know, when you go somewhere and like you got to smile. Just <laughs> inside you're like, <laughs> I'm not tipping you. <laughs> right, you guys? Like horrible service or something. I always end up tipping anyway. But anyway, with God, you don't got to do this. You don't got to just put on that smile. You can go before God the way that you are. See, prayer, when you talk to God, when you have an honest conversation of what's really going on, of the burden you feel, of the anger towards an injustice, do you feel angry towards an injustice? The conversation with God serves as a channel for divine comfort. Nehemiah's name means God is my comforter. God is my comforter. Because in the midst of challenges that we need to recognize the embrace of God and the comfort of God and the presence of God, I don't want to hold on to you with one hand. I don't just want you to pick me up, Lord. I want to see you face to face. I need, you to, I need your embrace. I need your comfort. He fasted and prayed. Nehemiah prayer and fasting was purposeful and intentional. He prayed to the one that could make the difference. Something Pastor Craig Rochelle said that I love, and he said this, if it's big enough to cry about, then it's big enough to pray about. Come on, write that down. So let's not be the type of people that leave prayer for the last resort. Because God plus one means more than able. He is more than able. Then Nehemiah said to God, then I said, oh, Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing, here it is again, unfailing love. If you felt like you've, you're not in the love of God, you're not deserving, two times today we've heard this, these words, unfailing love, unfailing, unfailing, unfailing love, unfailing, again and again and again and again. And he has this unfailing love to those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people of Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. Lord, we have sinned. We have allowed our gates to be left in ruins. We didn't put it in the proper boundaries. We stopped coming to church on a regular basis. We allowed certain things we shouldn't have allowed. We permitted, we didn't protect. It's important to recognize the why of the situation, why the walls were burned down. Yes, the devil is out to steal, kill, and destroy. He is on the prowl. He's like a thief trying to break in. But we left the window open. We unlocked the door. We opened up the garage. We did it, and we have to come before God and said, I have sinned against you, Father. I have a part to play in this. Help me. When Nehemiah heard that the walls were broken and his heart was broken, and then he, but that burden led him to go directly to God. He prayed for 40 days. But not only did he cry, not only did he sit down to cry, he knelt down to pray. But this is number three, and this is what we're going to be talking about next week. He stood up to rebuild. Yes, sit down to cry. Yes, kneel and pray and fast. But after that, stand up and rebuild. Stand up 
upon the rock, which is firm, and he is for us. Can someone say amen? He didn't go. Come on. Let's give God the glory for that. So many people stay in the second point, and they pray and fast, and they pray and fast, and they're, they're just prayer warriors, and they fast, but they're not standing up to rebuild. See, he didn't go into prayer with the assumption that praying was all he was willing to do. Come on, you guys. Oh, fasting is what I'm willing to do. I will pray in the morning. I'll connect to Zoom. I'll pray at night. I'll fast. What should I? Oh, I'm not eating meat and I'm not drinking coffee. Oh, Lord. First two days was rough. Rough on my headache. On my head, right? But is that all you're willing to do? Cry? Pray and fast? Or are you saying, Lord, I need you. I need you to give me strength. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to rebuild. With God, our sorrow becomes an open door to the opportunity of genuine change. Tears turn to prayers, and prayers fuel purpose to the degree that we can't help but act. What breaks your heart? What breaks your heart means that there's purpose. That's purpose. God's purpose inside of you. When will you stop just crying for it or praying for it? or fasting for it? When will you stand up and say, I am going to restore. I am going to rebuild. I will act. Can I get an amen? Yes, we can't do so everything, but we can do something. We can do something. And truth is that if it's important to you, you will find a way. If it's important to you, you will find a way. And if it's important to you, if it's not important to you, you'll find an excuse. I'm going to say it again. If it's important to you, you will find a way. You will find a way to restore. You will find a way to rebuild. You will find a way to renew. But if it's not important to you, oh, Lord, you will find an excuse like this. Why not? Not again. No, I already tried it. No, I've given up. No, try again. Because with God on your side, you plus God is more than able. Can I get an amen? Come on, church, stand to your feet. So stand firm and stand strong and stand up for truth. Stand holding on to his promises, which are a yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Believing that Isaiah's prophecy that I started the new year with, they, but I put we, will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. We will restore the places long devastated. We will restore the places long devastated. Can I get an amen? And we will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Then it goes on to say in verse 12, then you I'm declaring it over your life. Eyes are open in this moment. There's just a purpose. The Holy Spirit has been stirring something inside of you. Has been calling it out. Has been calling it forward. What breaks your heart? There's purpose behind that. That accompanies that answer. It says then you. 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 Will be known as a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. Because yes, we will sit down and cry. Yes, we will kneel down to pray and fast. But church, we will be a church that will stand up to rebuild. Can I get an amen? Can we give God the glory this morning? Come on, church.